Ladies and gentlemen, Baudurud. I'm Elham Yagobian, and it's an honor to address you today on behalf of the Iranian American Jewish Federation and our, on our president, Mr. Eliel Shmerni. We warmly welcome you to the third program of our five series exploring the historical ties between Iran and Jews, a collaborative effort with the Pakan organization. Just a few days ago, we celebrated Cyrus the Great Day, a significant occasion that allowed us to reflect upon an extraordinary historical figure. More than 2,500 years ago, King Cyrus not only liberated the Jewish people from the captivity, but also played a significant role in facilitating their return to the land of Israel. Importantly, he provided the financial support needed to help them rebuild their temple. This monumental event marked the com commencement of a rich history of Jewish communities residing within the Persian Empire, a legacy that continued through, uh, through the Sassanid era. In modern Israel and during the reign of the Pahlavi dynasty, the connection between Iran and Israel, the only Jewish country flourished once again. Today, we witness the remarkable resilience of Iranian people who courageously stand in solidarity with Israel despite the danger and risk they face. It is crucial to recognize that despite over four decades of propaganda against Israel and Jews in educational systems, media, and television, as the doctrine of the regime and the Iranian government's attempt to exploit the Jewish community in Iran for its own propaganda and political purposes, the people of Iran, regardless of their background, continue to express their unwavering uh, support for Israel. In minutes uh, to come, our esteemed speaker will de delve into the historical relationship and connection between Jews and Iran during the Sassanid era. But before that, let us extend a warm welcome to Mrs. Mitra Behnejad from Pakan Organization to share with us a few words. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am delighted to be here tonight representing PACON, the Persian American Civic Action Network, inspired and founded by our very own Zohre Mizrahi. <laughs> it's very stylish these days to say that we're not a political organization, but at PACON, we are somewhere on the border as we are striving very hard to get the Iranian American community to find their political voice, to become active politically, to be able to influence policy towards Iran. Especially, especially in light of the recent events of the past few weeks. I'm sure this esteemed audience has heard it all by now, all the arguments. So I'm not going to talk about that. But what I do want to talk about is the head of the snake, the Islamic Republic of Iran, the one that's funding and promoting and propagating all the trouble. There is no denying, absolutely no denying, their involvement with each and every calamity in the Middle East. Hezbollah, Hamas, Syrian militias, Houthis in Yemen, Iraq paramilitary groups, all under the tutelage and the blessing of the IRI. And as you know, their activities are not restricted to the Middle East, but they are actively attempting 
to export their poisonous ideology globally. And over four decades, this criminal regime has used the country's resources to line their own pockets, fund their terror proxies, develop nuclear capability, and prop up a massive propaganda machine to distort the facts, while 80% of the Iranians live under the, below the poverty line. Let me put it unto you, if Hamas are freedom fighters for the Palestinians, and they dearly are committed to the welfare of the Palestinians, then I guess the regime in Iran absolutely loves its own people. Hamas is there to sow the seeds of hatred and make sure that there will never be peace. Don't forget, don't forget that Israel was on the verge of signing a peace treaty with Saudi Arabia, and that would have brought about a completely different scenario between Israel and the Arab countries. This frightened and spooked Iran, so they mobilized their proxies and their lackeys, and in this case, of course, Hamas. And what about the $1 billion that Mr. Qasem Soleimani, may his soul never rest in peace, handed over in suitcases to Hamas and other wretched terrorist organization? Did that money go towards investing in the social, economic development and the education of the poor Palestinians? Or did it go to building tunnels, building ex explosives, and, and most shockingly, into the pockets of the Hamas leaders? The IRI, Islamic Republic of Iran, and Hamas are asking for martyrs. But I don't see, I don't see uh, Khamenei's kids or the kids of the IRGC volunteering to be martyrs. Instead, they've made, made Canada their playground, having lavish parties in their lavish man mansions. Hamas is asking the Palestinians to be human shields, but the kids of Mr. Esmail Haniyeh are staying at expensive hotels in Qatar, courtesy of the money that belongs to the Iranian people. Now, why is the Western media not embarrassing them? Why is it not all over the news, only in the hidden corners of social media. What I don't understand is why the West keeps thinking that the IRI is a rational entity, a legitimate government, and that you can negotiate with them. We Iranians are not asking for a ground invasion of Iran or bombing of Iran. We have family there. What we are asking is, why is it that the U.S. is constantly throwing them a lifeline? That's all we're asking for, is stop legitimizing them. When are we going to understand that the national security interests of the U.S. and Europe and the world are in line, are in complete alignment with the freedom-loving people of Iran. Thank you very much. Yes, now it's our the great moment. It's a great honor and privilege to introduce our distinguished speaker today, Dr. Shahin Nejad. Shahin's life journey has been marked by a deep-rooted connection to his homeland, Iran, and commitment to fostering positive change and progress. He earned a bachelor's degree in petroleum process engineering from Sharif University, um, and his master's degree in petroleum reservoir engineering from University of Oil Industry in 1991. 
He then worked in the UK's oil industry from 97 to 2005 before relocating to Houston to continue his work in the same field. But Shahin's passion for his homeland went beyond his professional life. In 2014, he co-founded the Iranian Renaissance Movement with a mission to bring about a cultural revolution in Iran, breaking free from oppression and suppression. Shahin is also an accomplished author, having written books on historical, political, and cultural topics. His monographs include titles such as Iran Shah and the Downfall of Sassanid Dynasty and Zoroaster, A Global Perspective. His insights have led to interviews on Iranian radio and TV stations based outside Iran. Today, we are fortunate to have Shahin as our distinguished speaker, and we eagerly anticipate the valuable insights and wisdom he will share with us. So please join me in extending a warm welcome to my dear friend and intellectual uh, colleague, Dr. Shahin Nejad. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and good evening. It's great to be among the compatriots these days uh, with different occasions, and especially with a topic which I hope uh, would be very interesting for you to hear maybe for the first time. Uh, when we talk about the bonds, the relation between Iran and the Jews, uh, most likely, <clears throat> people refer to the Hakamanids period, Hakamanishian era. And we know all about the Cyrus the Great and all the Hakamanids kings and their relation and their protection of the Jews in the secular and also in the religious text. But rarely we have heard or we have read about the relation between uh, Arsacid and Sassanid uh, dynasties with the Jews in Iran or Iranian Jews. And uh, when I uh, mention some of the stories related to this topic, I think uh, you would be surprised, as I was surprised when I read them in the first place. Uh, <clears throat> although my expertise or field of studying in the history has been the Sasanian period, which is roughly from early third century to mid seventh century. But before I started this research, I had no clue about things that I read in some of these sources regarding Iranian Jews and relation of Iran Shah as the country with Jews, even, even uh, Jews who were not Iranian. So uh, it was pretty surprising reading about it. Uh, about three years ago, I started my research to write a book with the name of Iran Shah and the Jews. Uh, I wasn't working on that continuously, but whenever I got a chance, I continued working on the topic, and I hope uh, sometime in 2024 I can have that book ready to publish. And what I'm going to share with you tonight uh, are samples from uh, some text that I've put together for that book. Uh, so you will see more samples and more stories and more elaboration on that in the book when uh, it's published. Uh, it's pretty important to mention that when we talk about uh, Jews in Iran, people remember the time of Cyrus the Great, those who were in Babylon and they were liberated by Cyrus the Great, so they went back to 25, 26 centuries ago. But there are two elements there are two indications which take us back further behind the time of Cyrus the Great about presence of Jews in the Iranian Peninsula, in Falate, Iran. One of them is 
the Jews in Bukhara. Bukhara in Central Asia, currently located in Uzbekistan, is a city, is, a, is an Iranian city by civilization, by history, by culture, by language, and by even ethnic group. And you've got, we used to have a considerable population of Jews in Bukhara, and they were reduced to a smaller number after their migration to Israel in just, I would say, immediately after collapse of the Soviet Union. But archaeological works and also some hard evidences showed that the Jews were there in Bukhara in one of the strongholds of the Iranian civilization way before the time of the Cyrus the Great. We are talking about 32, 33 centuries ago. So as long as the Iranian civilization was there, we had a community of Jews living in Bukhara. Still, you've got their districts. You can see their synagogue. You can see some of the schools. Few of them are on here and there, and some of them had been closed over the decades because of the less number of population. The second indication that the Jews were in Iran before the time of the Cyrus the Great is a population of Jews living in Damavand, in north of Iran. Those who are familiar with Iran geography, they know Damavand is not that much far from Tehran. And uh, they used to be called Gilad Jews. Gilad apparently used to be a name of a place between Haifa and uh, Orshalim, Jerusalem. So the name had come from that area, but apparently they lived there for a longer period, longer than 25 centuries or 26 centuries. At the peak of their population, they, were, they, ex they exceeded 60,000 population. 60,000. For that time, it's a huge population. They were so important somehow that when the second temple of Jews was reconstructed, was rebuilt, the altar of the Book of Ezra traveled from Tisfun, southwest of Iran, to Damavand, probably 2,000 kilometers, maybe more, to get them and to give them the good news that the temple has been reconstructed. So let's go back to Jerusalem. And they said, it's a good news, but this is our homeland. We are not going anywhere. And uh, he stayed there for a while, and he, he couldn't convince them to accompany him uh, to Jerusalem. So at the end, he wished them a, a bad luck. Uh, you can see it in, in some of these old texts. So the Jews in Gilad stayed there. The last time that they were mentioned was toward the early time of the Qajar dynasty. And in that time, they had reduced to only 100 families. So some migration and probably some conversion due to high pressure during Safavid and uh, Qajar dynasty caused that the population shrinked. And it wasn't just in Damavand. We know the story about Jews of Mashhad uh, during the Qajar dynasty as well. Having said that, it's, I mean, the Islamic period of the Iranian history is not all dark for Jews. Remember, within just the Islamic period of the Iranian history, we've got three Iranian Jews who became prime minister in Iran. Sadu Doleh, Khaji Rashiduddin Fazlullah Hamedani, and Ibrahim Khan Kalantar Shirazi. So having two of them before Safavid and one of them at the end of the Zandia period showed that although the Jews living uh, level and standard and their freedom, also it had its own ups and downs during the Islamic period, but it was way, way better than what happened in Europe to Jews. I'm not talking about 20th century, I'm talking about the medieval age. I'm comparing apple with apple.
So, today focus is on Sasanid period. Why Sasanid period is very important? Sasanian dynasty? Because of two things. One of them is we've got a lot of sources regarding Sasanian. We do not have that much of information and data regarding Ashkanian or Arsacid, the dynasty immediately before Sasanian. These two dynasties together ruled Iran for nine centuries between invasion of Alexander to invasion of Muslims. So the second reason that uh, Sasanian period is very important is by definition, by default, this is the period that Zoroastrianism became the state religion in Iran. So out of Hecumenids and Arsacids, Ashkanian and Sassanid, Sasanian, Sasanian got the reputation to be Zoroastrian and in some extent orthodox according to some resources. And according to others, we've got things here that surprise everyone, including myself. When I read that, I felt proud and also I felt relieved that <clears throat> regardless of all bad things that happened in the history, when we were doing the right things, we were really among the good people. And I hope this time, with what happens in Middle East, our compatriots showed that they understand what side of the history is the right one, and they do their best to stay at the right side, regardless of all the oppression and suppression which has been on them uh, so far in the past 44 years. Okay. Uh, There have been a lot of talks, speeches, articles, books regarding the influence of the Iranian school of thought or even Zoroastrianism worldview on uh, Judaism. Uh, Levy in the Encyclopedia of uh, Judaica has brought a bunch of those like the uh, Day of Judgment, Hell and Heaven, uh, Izadan, Gods and Goddess, Goddesses, uh, the concept of Ahriman, Devil. These are the elements that Levi said it wasn't there in the first place in the doctrine of Judaism. It was absorbed during the Achaemenid periods. And Mary Boyce, a very famous Iranologist in the 20th century, Mary Bush says that not only in terms of worldview and the school of thought, but also in terms of some rituals, there have been a high influence from the Iranian side on the uh, Judaism. But that's not the subject of this talk. This is not about ritual or worldview. This is about history and the relation between the state, the government, the kingdom, and the Jews, and between the non-Jew Iranian and Iranian Jews. <clears throat> the first thing that surprised me, and we were not aware of that until late 80s, so I'm talking about 30 years ago probably. There is a rock relief, very famous in Iran, called Rock Relief of Ardashir Babakan in Nakhshorostam. This is the most famous rock relief inscription uh, from the time of uh, Sasanian. Uh, Ardashir Babakan, the founder of Sasanian dynasty, the founder of Iran Shah, he's receiving a ring from Ahura Mazda. On the chest of his horse, there are inscriptions in three languages. Uh, Pahlavi, which is Middle Persian, in Arsacid version, in Sasanian version, because of north and south of Iran, there were some dialogues, some differences in the dialogues, and the Greek. So that was in the textbook, everybody knew about that. But what happened, the Museum of Art and History in Brussels, University of Brussels in uh, 
cooperation with the Museum of Art and History of Brussels, they managed to get some digital photos. They exaggerated the photos, and they could read the inscription in Hebrew. So founder of Iran Shah, a dynasty which made Zoroastrianism the official state religion, allowed an inscription in Hebrew for any reason, maybe for protecting the Iranian Jews, maybe for giving them the new message that after Arsacid, you're still good, because during the Arsacid period, Jews had a golden era in Iran. And that was maybe one, uh, one symbol to show that you are with us. So don't worry. It here is, is not Roman Empire. You're a piece of us and vice versa. Having the Middle Persian inscription and with a smaller font having a Hebrew in is inscription, that is amazing. You never see such a distinct in any other inscription. Not only in Iran, but also in the Near East and Middle East. <clears throat> and remember, this is the gentleman at the Shire Baba Khan. That if you talk to a commoner, somebody who's not educated in history, or well educated in history, say, oh yeah, the guy was a Rastarian, these guys were Orthodox, they give hell to everybody. Wrong. That was something else. The hard evidence is something else. Um, after Ardashir Baba Khan, we have Shapur I, his son, the second Sasanian king. He is very famous because he's the only king in the world who have beaten three Roman emperors in battles. He overcame three famous Roman emperors. And he managed to capture the big piece of the Roman Empire, including Jerusalem. He had two advisors. He had more, but two of his advisors were Jews. One of them with the name of Samuel or Shamuel. He was Iranian Jew, born and raised in Tisfun, in the capital of the Sasanian. And the second one was uh, Rob, who was born in Jerusalem, moved to Tisfun, and settled in Tisfun. These two were very close to Shapur. And if you look at the Babylon Talmud, there are a lot of stories about their interactions with Shapur, the way that they admire the king for his intelligence, for his forgiveness, for his uh, generosity, for his justice. It's amazing. Uh, that's something that you can read in Talmud. But a couple of things that I wanted to mention here was Samuel, the one who was born and raised in Iran, he was Iranian by several generations. He was a medical doctor. And uh, he was very close to Shapur. What he did, he ordered the fellow uh, Jews that from now on, on the contrary of the Arsacid period, the previous dynasty, this law is the state law. We do not have and we do not practice the religious law here. The country is treating all the objects, all the citizens in the same way, regardless of their religious background or ethnic background. So you have to observe the state law. Whatever is issued from the Iranian government is the law which should be practiced among us. All the bills issued by the Iranian courts is our decision. All the uh, orders by local governors are things that we have to obey and we have to respect. So that caused that the religious courts and also uh, religious local leaders lost their control on the population and the population of Jews started uh, more integration with the non Jews Iranian. 
And this process of integration, later on you will see that flourished and caused something that I bravely call it forming of a nation state in a time which nobody expected definition of a nation state. Nation state in the West was formed in the 20, in 19th century in Europe. But all the definitions, all the characters that you can assign to a nation state, you can see during the Sassanid period. And one big indication of that is you see that same law is applied to everyone regardless of the background, regardless of the religion, regardless of the ethnic, ethnicity. What is important is the matter, which we call it today, citizen. You're a citizen, so you're treated exactly like the rest. And Shamuel was very important to make it happen. He acted somehow that this transition from religious rules and religious courts toward the secular state courts and rules happened very smoothly. This Shamuel has been a very, very interesting character. The more you read about him in the Babylon Talmud, you feel more interested on this character. He's, to me, he's a genius and he served Iran and he served his fellow Jews in the best way that he could uh, do. The second rabbi who was advisor of Shapur I is Rob. As I said, he was born in Jerusalem, he moved to Tisfun, and he settled there and he became close to Shapur. Rob wrote an interpretation on the Book of Solomon. And based on that, he condemned the action of some uh, Jews who were rich businessmen in getting interest from other people. I think in English they call it usury, rebakhari. And he condemned them to be out of religion because according to the Judaism, I don't know today, but at that time, it was bad. It, it, it was condemned and it was criticized. So he managed to convince Shapur, the king, to go to these successful Jews businessmen, seize the money that they had accumulated by charging interest, and redistributed it among the poor Jews. And also uh, among the non-Jews Iranian as well. This action was very interesting. First of all, it shows that <clears throat> the fact that we shouldn't get interest on investment when we loan money to somebody it was banned in the first place in Judaism. Maybe from there it, it diffused into Islam, I don't know. But the second thing is, this gentleman is a Jew himself. And he forces the king, he managed to convince the king that the wealth should be redistributed because this was wrong. And these guys were out of faith. So Shapur did it and that, uh, reinforce economically the poor Jews who were scattered uh, in the country. Something happened later on during uh, Bahram the I. I'm trying to move by time sequence. So now we get to Bahram, which is the fourth Sasanian king. Bahram the I in, in 275 had a tension with the uh, Jewish rabbi, or I would say more uh, adventurist maybe, uh, who was trying to make a campaign against the secular Jews. The way that the country was handling the matters was, since everything was the state law, not the religious law, so the secular 
persons manage to lead the society, regardless of being Zartushti or Christian or, or Jews or uh, Manishians. And that caused some uh, tension between the Orthodox Jews and the secular Jews. And Geneva made a campaign to get back the power from the secular characters to himself and to his followers. And he was suppressed. He was arrested and executed because of uprising against the state. Something that came up in that time was why we Jews should pay tax. During the Hachamanishi period, a communist period, we were exempt from paying tax. So why are you charging us tax? And the argument that Bahram I provided them was very solid. Bahram said, in that time, you were liberated just from the slavery. So they gave you the chance to rebuild the wells, to come up and get to a minimum living of, minimum standard of living which was fine, so you were exempt from paying tax. Now you're good economically, socially, and you're one of, uh, you are like anybody else. There is no exception. As a citizen of Iran Shah, you have to pay the tax. Doesn't matter, as I said, which religion do you have? And that was one argument that eventually the secular leaders of the Jewish community managed to full force and implement it in the society. So after that, paying tax was not a big deal. It's like anybody else, we have to pay the tax. I, I mentioned uh, the word of Iran Shah a few times. Uh, let me just uh, elaborate on that for those who are not familiar with this term. Iran Shah is the simplified current Farsi form of the, this phrase, Ariana Khashatra. Ariana Khashatra means uh, the Aryan's imperium, or the state of Iranian, or the country of the Iranian, or the kingdom of Aryans. So that was the official name of Iran before Muslim invasion. Then by time, we kept using Iran, 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 and then Iran, Shah became Iran. Shah in Pahlavi means country, Keshwar, state, not the city. As today we call it city, city is Shah. But Shah, Khashatra was country with the government, with the nation, so it was a nation state. So when you heard Iran, Shah, that's the root of the word. Now, after Bahram, uh, we see a very, very uh, shiny time for the uh, Iranian Jews in terms of uh, accumulating wealth, in terms of social ranking. And somebody was asking why the Jews were in heaven in Iran, but Christians sometimes were suppressed or persecuted. Why? And the answer was very clear. There was no Jewish state out of the Iranian border. The loyalty of Jews in Iran were just to the state of Iran. But the enemy of the Sasanian, the Roman Empire, Roman, Eastern Roman Empire, or Byzantine, they became Christian, and by Constantine, their emperor, Christianity in 313, I believe, became the official religion in Eastern Roman Empire. What happened because of this sympathy, some of the Iranian Christian, especially Mesopotamia, uh, southwest of Iran, east of Iraq, they were acting behalf of the Roman state in Iran. There have been a lot of reports about spying by Christians for the Roman Empire. And Iran and Roman Empire were two big enemies, or at least competitors, 
Imagine during the Cold War between Soviet Union and US, some people got the reputation to act behalf of one of these superpower in the other one. How do you manage to handle them? You try to monitor them. And if you feel there is a conspiracy, you try to capture and, and suppress them. Very interesting, there are some reports that the Jews were worried about the activity of Christians in some parts of Iran. Like Zartushti people, they were reporting to the local governors and regional leaders the suspicious activities of some Christians for spying for Roman Empire. That caused that the Jews were treated exactly as insiders, and Christians always were considered somehow outsider unless proven differently. And that was the way it went until the time of the Yazgir the first, so almost middle time of the Sasanian period. He said, why we are worried about Christians? Because they've got their own brothers at the other side of the border, yeah? And they've got their church, the Jacobian church, which they are loyal to. What about if we build, if we form, if we uh, implement a church system in Iran and they brought up this Nasturian church idea? So rather than going after the church of Roman Empire in Byzantine, let's be loyal to the Iranian church. And he practically solved the issue of Christians almost forever in Iran. So from middle, almost middle years of the Sasanian period, the Christians also got the uh, level that the Jews found by making them dependent on the Nasturian church rather than Jacobian church, which, which was uh, Eastern Roman church. Jacobian church in that time was acting like Vatican today. So what you should do, like the Greek Orthodox church that Russian had, or they had it in, in Near East, they founded the Nasturian church. So that was one reason that the Jews during the Sasanian were always insider, like other non-Jew Iranian, but Christians for not always, but in some periods of time, were persecuted or in some cases because they were so fanatic. The Christians at the time of the Sasanian period, some of them were so fanatic, they set fire to some fire temples of Zoroastrians. They uh, killed and peeled the skin of a couple of temple, uh, fire temple workers, here boots. Uh, so it's, it's totally uh, natural that when you see that, you capture them, you punish them. Uh, 70 or 80 Christians over 430 years of ruling of Sasanian got executed. So we are not talking about massacres. We are talking about case by case punishment of those who have done something wrong, either f setting fire to a fire temple or spying for Roman empires. And the interesting thing is, <clears throat> twice the Iranian army during the Sasanian period managed to capture Israel. Israel was under occupation of Roman empire perhaps and because of the Jew-Christian you know, uh, rivalry there, uh, they were not in a good position. Both times, the first time during the Shapur I and the second time during Khosu Parviz, the Jews in Israel, I'm not talking about Iranian Jews, the Jews of Israel helped directly the Iranian army. The second time, when the army of Iran during the Khosrow Parvis time got close to uh, Jerusalem, 20,000 people, all Jews, appraised against Roman Empire. And they, in the battle, they beat Romans before Iranians got to the gate of Jerusalem. That was amazing. 
And then a Jew became the governor of Jerusalem and the surrounding area for three years. So for three years, the Iranian state, the Iranian government appointed a Jewish to rule the city that is still half of the population of the city were Christians. Uh, and within that uh, three years, uh, perhaps you can imagine that uh, some Jews decided to retaliate their suppression during the ruling of the Roman Empire. So what I'm saying is, it's, it wasn't just about Iranian Jews, it's about two entities, Iranian and Jews, even if they were not Iranian, like Jews of Israel. It happened twice. <clears throat> um, there, there are very nice stories when you read these texts, and it's really impressive. Ifra Hormuz, is mother of Shapur II. Some people, some writers write that, believe that she was Jew, and some say she was not Jew, but she had a very good relation with Jews. Ifra Hormuz sent some presents to a Jewish rabbi, a one that had a very good relation with, for charity activities. The rabbi accepts the money and he managed to communicate with some people in Roman Empire, in Byzantine. He pays for releasing of the Iranian who were prisoners of war in Roman Empire. Imagine, he got the money, he can communicate and figure out that there are some Iranian as prisoners of war who have become slaves in Roman Empire. How much we should pay to get them released? This much. Okay, here you go. And they return to Iran and join their families. This is really impressive from both sides, from Ifra Hormuz, mother of the king, and also from this rabbi. Second time, Ifra Hormuz, uh, presented 400 dinar to the same rabbi. 400 dinar is 400 golden coins. So it's a significant amount of money for that time. And rabbi accept the money and immediately it distributes the money among the poor. And it was recorded that the money was received and it was given to these people in these parts of the city. Uh, Ifra Hormuz once prevented the king to punish another rabbi. The story was a Jewish man had a sexual relation with a non-Jewish woman. And according to some uh, religious ritual or traditions, uh, he was sentenced to receiving lashes by this rabbi. The Jewish man died under these lashes. It was too hard for him. When King found out that somebody died because of lashes, first of all, he was angry that why you carried out a religious rule. As we taught and we said, and uh, everybody accepted, the law is the state law. So you were not allowed to lash someone because of, I don't know, uh, sexual relation with a non-Jew. Second of all, you killed the guy. So he wanted to uh, execute this rabbi, but Ifra Hormuz came again and managed to convince his son, the, sh the king, Shapur II, to reduce the sentence and the, the rabbi survived. Another story which is very interesting is, this is in Talmud. Uh, a non-Jew Iranian, probably a Zoroastrian Iranian, he goes to the rabbi Samuel and says, I want to become a Jew. 
I want to convert to Judaism. How can I do it? Someone says, you need to study Torah. And he said, okay, teach me Torah. And he said, first you should learn some Hebrew, and then you can study Torah, and then you can convert to Judaism. And he said, okay. What happened later on, it's not important. The point is here. In a country that there is official state religion of Zoroastrianism, an Iranian Zartoshti walks in and very freely relaxed without any tension, without any fear, says, I want to convert to Judaism. And the rabbi gave him the right direction for this conversion. So where is that orthodoxy that everybody was talking about? Where is that, that blood suckers, Zartoshti people who wanted to give hell to all Christians and Jews? Where is that? This is in Talmud. In the universities, unfortunately, they go after uh, stereotype uh, lectures. These type of lectures are hidden somewhere else. Or sometimes you can say nobody pays attention, but sometimes I feel it's intentional to ignore this. Because if you bring it up and you show that 17 centuries ago, this was the nice relation between people in a country, then it's very embarrassing for some people to confess that in 20th century or 19th century or even now in 21st century, they treat others like subhuman. So they try to just ignore it, not mention it, especially because it belongs to another part of the world. It's not the legacy of the Westerner civilization. It belongs to a country which today, because of the current regime, got the bad label, bad reputation. But because of that, we don't get a credit for this type of coexistence and lovely relation between subjects with each other and between subjects and the king, the state, and people all around the country. Grishman, the famous iranologist, believed that wife of Yazger I was Jew. So we've got two persons during the Sasanian period. One of them is for sure a Jewish person. Wife of Yazger I. So we had a Jewish queen. Who is she? She's mother of Bahram Egur. Bahram Egur has a Zartoshti father and Jewish mom. And for Ifra Hormuz, they say she might or might not. So at least one or maximum two queens of the Sasanian period were Jews. Another indication that uh, mother of Bahram Egur, the queen, was Jewish and very likely she was a believer, not just a like Jewish, was he, she managed to teach Hebrew to Bahram Egur. Bahram Egur could speak Hebrew. It's interesting, Bahram could speak Hebrew when the Iranian Jews couldn't speak Hebrew. They were speaking Pahlavi, I, I tell you later. So, because of that religious feelings that the queen had, he wanted his son to be able to read Torah. So we are talking about fourth century, fifth century. I'm not talking about 2023. This might seem easy now, but just compare it with what happened in China in that era, what happened in Roman Empire, what happened in anywhere in the world. It's not comparable, it's amazing. And Bahram Egur, what he did, he said, as long as the Jews, their core activities, their headquarters of the religious teaching schools are in Jerusalem under 
the ruling of Roman Empire, they are in trouble. He got them into Tisphon. So all of these religious schools moved to Tisphon from Jerusalem, and he gave them enough space and enough funds to do whatever they want to do, rather than staying there and suffer under the Roman Empire. Now, there are a few things that I wanted to mention, and that is pretty interesting. One of them is, Rob UC, the Jewish uh, leader of the community uh, in late third century. So we are talking about early to mid uh, years of the Sasanian period. He encouraged fellow Jews to speak Pahlavi as mother language, as the first language. And it happened over one or two generations. So Jews became uh, more Iranian from that point of view, a way before Muslim invasion to Iran. And then all of us together learn Farsi instead of Pahlavi, which is modern Persian rather than Middle Persian. So in terms of speaking Farsi, all of us learn Farsi together. And in terms of Pahlavi, the Jews learn it and made it a mother language way before many, many of the ethnic groups of the Iranian in Iranian Peninsula. And this is very important. When Shapur II beat the Roman Empire in Armenia, Armenia today is a small country. In that time, it was big. It covered a big portion of the current Turkey. Uh, he asked the Armenian uh, officials to enforce the Iranian language again in Armenia. And they said, why do you care? He said, the language is not just a language. The language brings feelings, bring, brings culture, brings sympathy. And he was very intelligent to say that. Armenia lost the Iranian language only they carried on with the Armenian language, and gradually, because of the Christianity, they separated from the rest of the Iranian world. This is a practice that the Jews didn't do. So they stayed within the core of the Iranian world. Another factor that I wanted to mention is Shaul Shaket, a very famous uh, researcher, Jewish researcher, he says that the Iranian Jews started using belt, koshti, like Zartushti people, the belt that you've got there, to distinguish themselves from Jews who were not Iranian. This is very important. Why they wanted to be recognized or to be distinguished from their fellow Jews because in Mesopotamia, there were all people, businessmen, farmers, military people, they were coming and going. Intentionally, they had it on just to show that I'm an Iranian citizen. I'm citizen of Iran Shah. And even we've got some uh, cemeteries that on the grove of some of these death people, it says this name, from this village, Sharvan de Iran Shar, citizen of Iran Shar. This is pretty impressive. And also, uh, Shaul Shaket mentions that the Iranian Jews are the only Jews that are uh, were, uh, de in that time who were not speaking or talking during eating lunch or dinner. Apparently, other Jews had this habit to talk or, I don't know, whisper or pray, I don't know. But this was something that the Iranian Jews adopted, maybe in conjunction with their non-Jews friends or neighbors, not to talk or whisper or pray during eating. So when you eat, you just eat. 
There are a lot of these examples Shaul Shaket has brought in his books, but I've just mentioned a couple of them. Also, uh, there are uh, there have been two incidents that uh, Jews were killed by the Sasanian government, but not because they were Jews, because they were among the Iranians who opposed the, the, the king or the system. It's very important. Sometimes you suppress some people because of their DNA, because of their blood, or because of their religion, or because of their social class. But sometimes that's not the case. During the time of Kovad, Kovad is father of Anushirwan. Kovad became Mazdaki. He started following the doctrine of Mazdak. Mazdak, for those who are not familiar with him, was a socialist, or maybe today you can call him communist of his own era. Okay? And Kovat liked his opinion, his doctrine. He said, I'm with you. You go ahead and do whatever you want to do in terms of reforms, getting the lands distributed among people, get the wealth and distributed among people, and I'm with you. And perhaps you can expect. There are uprisings here and there in the country against Kovat and against Mazdak. And there are some people who are with Kovat, the king, and the Mazdak. Among these, in Shush, which was a very stronghold of the Iranian Jews, also there, were, there was uprising against Kovat. What are you doing to this country? I mean, Exactly, imagine somebody is practicing communism. So when Kovad managed to come back from exile because he was sent to exile, and when he returned, he suppressed and overthrown those leaders who had uh, got the power in the different provinces, Zoroastrians or Jews, didn't matter whoever opposed him because he had become Mazdaki. So this is a very important factor. If somebody says Kovat killed some Jews in Shush, yes, but same time he killed some Zartushti in, in, uh, in Shushtar, and he killed some Zartushti in Neshabur because they were opposing him, not because they were Jews or Zartushti or Christian or whatever. This is a very important thing. Another thing is, Uh, there is a big crisis at the time of Khosrow Parviz. Khosrow Parviz the king and his famous general Bahram Chubin came to a big fight for getting the power and the country was divided those who supported Bahram Chubin and those who were loyal to Khosrow Parviz. Bahram managed to beat Khosrow Parviz. Khosrow Parviz escaped from Iran. He went as an asylum to the Roman Empire and he became son-in-law of the Roman Emperor. Then the Roman Emperor helped him to return. Bahram made a mistake. He was a great general and very wise man, but he made one mistake. He crowned himself. That was a big mistake because people said, no, the king has to be from the Sasanian family. So now you're seizing the power, not because of sake of the country, you're seizing it, you're capturing the crown for yourself. So they gave up support of Bahram or at least the popular support for him was reduced significantly. When Khosrow Parviz managed to return, perhaps he gave a very hard time to those who supported Bahram, including some Iranian Jews. So again, the matter was totally political. Khosrow, Khosrow Parviz, 
executed about 3,000 people who were, who were with Bahram, and several hundreds of them were Jews. And probably more than a couple of thousands were Zartoshti. So when we get to this concept, remember that punishing someone doesn't mean that the guy had something against that particular person. Sometimes it's political, sometimes it's a matter of national security. We know that Reza Shah didn't have any kind of uh, religious heart feeling against anyone. He was totally a like person. Now, there was a Jew, we, he was the representative of the parliament, representative of the Iranian Jews in the parliament for a short period. I forgot his first name, but Mr. Haim, but I forgot his first name. Dawood, Dawood or Suleiman Haim, yes. He was <clears throat> arrested and uh, taken to the court because he had in a conspiracy with Sarhang Puladin and some other people to make a coup d'etat against Reza Shah. So Sarhang Puladin was executed, some other elements were executed, some of them were sent to the jail, including Hayem. They stayed there for several years, they died in the jail. Now if somebody says Reza Shah killed a Jew, this is ridiculous. He was sentenced to whatever in jail, because of the conspiracy. And the other people, his team, none of them were, were, was, were Jew. They were Muslims. Therefore, we have to be clever. When we hear these stories, we need to figure out what was the motive, what was the reason. At the end, I'm just trying to make a short conclusion. And uh, that is, although during the Islamic period, the non-Muslims in Iran had sometimes tough time, sometimes very tough time, sometimes more relaxed time and peaceful time. But before Islam, during the Hakamanishi period, Ecumenids, Arsacid, and Sassanid periods, if we are just, if we are wise, if we are open-minded, and we read the history, carefully and unbiased, we really feel uh, proud of the society that we had and people could live together with love, peace, and prosperity. And there are a lot of documents to support it. I'm trying to make it happen, write a book on this in Farsi, because I really think our compatriots should know more about this. This is a very important and sensitive topic. And I hope in 2024, if I'm still alive, I can finish it. Thank you. Uh, can you um, justify and explain the historical uh, representation that Anushirawan uh, persecuted many Mithraists and burned many temples that belonged to um, people that were believers in Mithraism. I think you were referring to Mazdakis, not Mithraists, Mazdaki. Anushirawan, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anushirawan is son of Kovad. As I mentioned earlier in my talk, Kovat became Mazdaki himself. So he gave a lot of support to Mazdak. And whenever you've got a reformer, the reformer might bring an idea. Okay, the wealth has to be redistributed among people. We should reduce the difference between poor and rich which seemed fine. I think Kovat said, yeah, that's wise. This is something that I like and I want to practice, yeah? Like Karl Marx, he brought some idea, Marxism, but when it got to the practice, we ended up with Stalin in, in Soviet Union, okay? A monster. About Mazdak, what he said was not too off, but in practice, what happened, a bunch of mobs 
started seizing people's money, going to people's house and seizing the house for themselves, getting some women in the street, rape them because women are for everyone. There is no marital status. We are all sharing everything. Let's enjoy the life. That was so extreme somehow that when people managed to get Kova to resign, they supported not the, his first son, who was Mazdaki. They supported his second son, Anushiravan. Anushiravan, the first thing that he wanted to do was just figuring out bunch of the children who had been born in those years, who is the father? So when it got to a chaos and you couldn't control the society, it's the matter of social security, it's the matter of national security. There was no other choice for Anushiravan to suppress the mobs and reinforce the rule. Let me just give you a similar case. Amir Kabir, he's admired by, by everyone in Iran, correctly. But when Bobby movement became a big deal in Iran, and in all cities, Bobbies and Shia were killing each other, he ordered capturing uh, Sayyid Ali Muhammad Bob. And they captured him and they put him in a prison and then they executed him. Nobody blames Amir Kabir for that, except our Baha'i compatriots. Why? Because he didn't have any other choice. The country was in chaos. You have to do something. You cannot go and kill the majority, so at least suppress the revolting Baha'i or Babis. That was the case. I am Jewish, which came to Iran, and I have documentation in 1492. 1492, when they kicked Jews out of Spain. They went west, they went to Ottoman Empire and Iran, and I ended up in a small town in Iran, and I, my, I have name of my 12th generation father and grandfathers there. Jews in Iran used to write in a, what we call Ashurit. Ashurit is a line who probably came from Assyrian, mm -hmm. probably. Yeah. In your studies, do you have any documentation of any other writing with any other alphabet? For the Ashurian, Assyrian, no, doctor? not for Assyrian, for Iranian writing. When I was a kid, uh, my father wrote a letter to his father. He wrote it with Ashurit. Oh, okay. I, I think, doctor, uh, you're referring to something that it used to be Seriani. And because it was practiced in Ashur, in the north of the Mesopotam Mesopotamia, also some people refer to that as Asuri or Ashuri. The Syriani language was the language of the Christians, Christian religious school in Iran, but it became uh, a kind of common language, an alphabet, an special alphabet for some intellectuals toward the end of the Sasanian period and beginning of the Islamic period. I think you're referring to that one. So the origin of the Ashurit goes back to to Syriani language. It's called Syriani. Syrian. Yes. Yeah. That makes sense. That's right. Mr. Najad, I should appreciate uh, on my behalf, of course, and of course everybody else, uh, for your unbelievable speech. By the way, I would like to just make a record clear that uh, Mr. Haim, Shemuel Haim, unfortunately had been executed mm -hmm. in 1931. Mm -hmm. And he, he has been executed. He was That's executed it. when he was in No, prison. no, he didn't go, he went to jail, but uh, okay. therefore after the 
some time mm -hmm. they executed him. He got the death sentence, you mean? And was yes, he, he okay. got the death yeah. sentence. Because Thank all you. who were involved in that coup were executed, so it's uh, yes. it's not surprising that he was executed as well. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Any more question? Thank you so much, uh, Shine John. Thank you. Shahim flew from Texas to be with us tonight. I really appreciate it for being with us tonight, and thank you all for being here today. Hopefully, we see you again for another program. Have a good night.